yeah, let's let's get started. Um, so uh, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us again. Um, the last meeting was really fun and um, I'm looking forward to talking about Milwaukee baseball history. Um, I think almost all of you have some connection to it. So, so Jack, is that a Milwaukee Brewers hat you have on? Yeah, it's a, a bit field flannels, uh, yeah. Milwaukee Brewers, old school nice. American association. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think um, some of you got an email or saw on the Ken Keltner Facebook page that Bob was on uh, WWM, which is our local NPR station. And um, maybe Bob Bob can give his thoughts. I thought it was a really nice thing. They had um, LaToya Dennis do, it was almost kind of like a Black History Month version of a tribute to uh, at, uh, Orchard Field. So um, it was really nicely done. And you can listen to it on the WUWM website. They have you know, a little link that you can click and listen to it. So, um, so yeah, how did that go, Bob? It went fine. I was not expecting it. I really? just got a call one day and she said, can I ask you a couple of questions? And then she said something about uh, doing an interview. And uh, she said, could you do it right now? So <laughs> wow. That was what we did. So I was totally unprepared. Wow. It, it, it was good. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what preparation I need, but it's nothing I would have done differently. But anyway, she was uh, interesting to talk to. And she emailed me then with a couple other questions uh, the following day. So we're old friends now. All right. She seems like a nice woman. I met her on um, uh, kind of a Black Lives Matter protest. She was, she, she was covering those for a while. So, um, yeah, so, um, and she certainly mentioned you as the person to talk to about Orchard Field. So, um, let's see. Uh, I don't know if people want to mute. Um, we're getting some little noise from dishes or whatever. So, um, I think we're fine. We don't have too many people that we have to mute. But if, if you think things are going to be noisy, we can mute. So, um, so yeah, there I think we can all, you know, Bob, you can just kind of go on with um, what you'd like to tell us about Borchard Field. Has everybody read the book pretty much? Yeah, and, and like on the WUWM presentation, I think one thing that Bob mentioned was almost every notable person, player or figure from baseball went through Borchard Field. Um, it's really an amazing list of characters. Uh, so except for Hank Aaron. Did, Bob, did he ever play at Portrait? No, he didn't. No, no. No, if he had, I would have certainly written about him. I know, I know, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, he, his uh, year at Eau Claire was 52. Mm -hmm. and the ballpark was torn down at the end of that season. Right. Yeah. Uh, if he had been a, a year earlier, could have got him. Got Matthews. Mm -hmm. um, when I started doing this, Rick, you'll remember this probably better than I do, but this, our idea was to have a Kel Keltner chapter project. And we thought maybe we could find some common theme and then have everybody research and write about one aspect of it. it could be anything. It could be about a team name or the color of their shoes or whatever one, anybody wanted, but nobody wanted. <laughs> We, we started, we got together one time, Dennis, I'm sure you were there. Uh, I don't remember where it was, if it was a UWM or someplace. And we talked about it and then it, it died. Nobody ever wrote anything except me. Um, and I, I wasn't sure where it was gonna go. I didn't think I was gonna write a whole book about it, but I started researching it. And as I always do, I get interested in the research and it just carries over and it keeps me going. Um, so there were certain players that I had heard about that played in Orchard Field. I knew that Babe Ruth had. I'm not sure how I knew that, but just one of those bits of information you acquire. And uh, so I started 
trying to think of other people, figuring they wouldn't be there, but they were. And I did so many of these that um, it turned into a book. In fact, there were 13 chapters that never made it to the book. They're written, but the book was too large for the publisher's way of thinking. So I eliminated 13 chapters. So I'm not sure what I'll ever do with those. Um, but as I started looking into this, it was just amazing how many famous names from, well, not just baseball, but primarily baseball uh, appeared. The, um, the Negro League players, almost just about every well-known Negro League player appeared there for a, a couple of reasons. The, the Kansas City Monarchs would barnstorm pretty often. And so they got to orchard quite a few times. Um, the Chicago American Giants normally played their games in Comiskey Park. But if there were a change in the schedule because of a, a rain out or something, and they had to move, their backup ballpark was Orchard Field. So there were all, all kinds of the black players, uh, including Jackie Robinson. I figured I wouldn't find him, but I did. He appeared in one game there. Um, Satchel Page was there quite a few times. So I just kept going with this. I found Ty Cobb. Um, I would find a bit of information and it would lead to something else and I'd spend half of my time doing something totally unrelated. I, uh, let's see if I can give you a good example. Um, well, Jim Thorpe, I didn't know at that time that Jim Thorpe had played there. It turns out he played a whole season with the Brewers in 1916. And I thought, well, T, he was a football player. I wonder if he played football there. Well, sure enough, he did. And in fact, it's one of probably my favorite in history was played in Orchard in 1922. Mary, that was that article that I sent to you. Yeah. And that article was actually a, the, the one from the book is about half, well, not even half a third of the, the length of the original. And I liked the original a lot, I still do. I thought there was an interesting train of events. Uh, I was always very taken with that. It started out with some guys in, is it uh, Patterson, New Jersey or someplace out there? And yeah. Uh, yeah, and they were charged with robbing a, a store and, and killing the owner and well they weren't they weren't guilty at all i mean everything that they were were charged with they had a perfect alibi and anyway that led me to paul robeson well i thought i wonder if paul robeson played in orchard field well sure enough he did and the one particular game that i'm talking about had jim thorpe as the player coach of the orang indians well, I was taken by them right away, just if nothing else, the name. But there was a, a man in LaRue, Ohio, who had a dog kennel. And I thought, this sounds perfect. It's not related to anything. It's crazy. Well, I started following the little bits of information that I had. And this guy wanted to publicize his dog kennel. And he wasn't getting enough business. So he bought a franchise in the National Football League. They were in their first year. Uh, the NFL was actually started in 1922. And the Oorang Indians were one of the original teams. Well, uh, the names of the players were different and uh, not well known, at least not to me, but one of them was named Wrinkle Meat. I thought, it was, what a great name, Xavier Downwind, uh, which had to be a wide receiver with a name like that. Um, there was a guy named Bear, just one word, like Tarzan or Elvis. Or, his name was Bear. And at halftime, 
He wrestled a live bear out in the middle of the field. These are fantastic things that went on right here in Milwaukee. So anyway, they, that led to Paul Robeson and Thorpe being in the same game. There was a guy named Bo McMillan. I had heard of him. He had been a coach at Indiana. Before that, he was a player. He was in 1921, overnight sensation. And what happened was he was the, by far the best player on a team that uh, beat Harvard. Harvard was the big power in football in those days. And his team, uh, Center College in Kentucky, they beat Harvard by one touchdown scored, of course, by Bo McMillan. And so he later played in Milwaukee. He played on the same team as Paul Robeson. And so did Fritz Pollard. Fritz Pollard was possibly the, the first African-American head coach in the NFL. Um, and there are different claims about that. So he's first or maybe second. But this one game was just fascinating to me. And Robeson said that he described what he would do. He would take the train from New York, ride, ride overnight, arrive in Milwaukee in the morning, play the football game, and he'd go back the next day. Uh, after the game, they went to the Wisconsin Hotel, which was quite new at the time, and they would sing. So picture all these big husky guys getting together and singing. And I thought that was interesting. Um, Willie Mays. I couldn't imagine that Willie Mays would be there because he was too recent. Um, he didn't even play in the majors until, he, until 1951. And the team, the ballpark was torn down at the end of 52. But sure enough, there's Willie Mays. He played um, one weekend series. He was nine for 14. He had a couple of home runs and a couple of doubles, and he made some great catches. And this guy was obviously bound for the majors. And they had one more road series, and then he was called up to the Giants and stayed there. Uh, Mickey Mantle didn't start the season there. He made the, the roster of the Yankees in 51, and he was a really hot item. Everybody could see he was going to be a big star but he stopped hitting in summer. He just, he kept striking out and Stengel wouldn't put up with it. So he sent him to Kansas City. Well, Kansas City at the time was on the road. Of all places, Orchard Field. So here we got Mickey Mantle. Uh, same year, Eddie Matthews. He came out of the Navy and he was gonna go back to the double A team of the Braves. But instead they thought, well, we'll try him for a week or two in Milwaukee, which was a higher level team. And he wasn't sensational, but his last time at bat in Milwaukee, he hit a grand slam as a pinch hitter. And so everybody went to the bar across the street where the players always went after the game. And Charlie Grimm, the manager came up to him and said, hey, nice going kid, you're going back to Atlanta. So he went to Atlanta. And I don't know the exact reason, but it had something to do with a woman. It had nothing to do with baseball. They wanted to get him out of town. Uh, so they did. Um, anyway, I would just find a, another one and another one. I tried going back to the really old days. Uh, Hannes Wagner, for example. Well, sure enough, he played in Milwaukee. A lot of the teams, well, I don't know, but a lot, quite a few of the teams would play exhibition games during their own season. So for example, when uh, the Yankees played a four game series in Chicago against the White Sox, they either combined two games in a day, played a double hitter, or they maybe made up the game later from somewhere, but uh, they would come up to Milwaukee and play an exhibition. The reason was money. The, uh, if you have a team from out of the area, especially if they had some big stars like the Yankees did, they could make more money because there was so much interest in, the, in Milwaukee. So uh, 
Hannes Wagner was one that, that did that. And um, Connie Mack had connections here. Connie Mack had managed in Milwaukee, but they were not in Orchard Field. It was in uh, the Lloyd Street grounds. And um, so that didn't work, but I found that the athletics for about four or five years would play an exhibition game against the Brewers. And it was because Connie Mack had managed in Milwaukee in 1897. So he would go back and see the old folks and, and they'd play a game. Um, and let's see who else. Um, John McGraw, I figured, well, this is a long shot. John McGraw goes back to the 19th century. So I figured there's no chance. Well, it turns out he was there also. He played, he was a 14 year old shortstop playing for the Baltimore Orioles, which was not in, not the same Baltimore Orioles. This was a, uh, an American association team, not the same American association. That's the one we're more familiar with. But this is back in the 1890s and he played and uh, did fairly well. Um, anyway, the list goes on. And the more I, I got into this, I came across things that had nothing at all to do with baseball. This was the ballpark, but it was also a stadium. It was also a playground. It was, this is where you did sports and other related things in Milwaukee. There was no auditorium or anything like that. There were not very many football fields. So football games were frequently played in Orchard. All levels, the uh, high school teams and city conference high school games were played there. Uh, Buckets Goldenberg, it was an interesting one. Buckets played football at two different schools. I don't know why he changed after his junior year, but he played at both North and West high schools and did very well and got a scholarship and played for the Badgers in Madison and did very well. And so he played for the Packers and he's in the Packer Hall of Fame. Um, I don't think Buckets is his real name, but uh, anyway, he was, uh, he was a guy that touched all the bases. And then to top that off, he became a professional wrestler and he wrestled in Borchard Field. So, I was just, you know, the, I was hooked. I couldn't stop. Um, there was a, uh, a game played in 1930, a night game in 1930, which caught my interest because there were no lights in Borchard Field. And they can't play in total darkness, but it wasn't almost total. But the uh, one of the Negro League teams, which I believe was the Monarchs at the time, was uh, barnstorming. And they played, this is in September of 1930, and they played a night game and they brought their own lights. Well, they <clears throat> heard of such a thing, but they brought them and they had several long uh, telescoping kinds of poles. And it, I'm sure the, the visibility was very poor, but it was a, a novelty and people liked that. And they were happy to get a game. Um, wrestling. There were some really outstanding wrestlers that wrestled in Orchard Field. That the probably the best known in the Midwest would be Vern Gagne, and he wrestled there several times. The most interesting one to me was the Angel. The Angel was born in the uh, Ural Mountains, I think, and it, his family moved to uh, the United States in a, when he was about two years old. And he was the most beautiful child. The parents weren't the only ones. Everybody thought, what a beautiful child. And he was told this all the time. Oh, you're so beautiful. And anyway, he was beautiful. Everybody agreed. And when they came to the United States, as he grew, he stopped being so beautiful. And in fact, he became hideous to look at. He, uh, he developed acromegaly which is a, a disorder that completely disfigures you. Uh, 
your head gets really large. Maybe there's Barry Bond, I don't know. Um, and you have this huge chest and kind of skinny legs. Anyway, he uh, became known as the angel and he would advertise as the world's ugliest man, come and see him wrestle. I thought, well, that's different. Um, Babe Didrikson, this was a, a really terrific athlete. Back in the 30s, she started out, she was doing track and field. She later became a, a professional golfer, the best female golfer on, on the tour at right, one time. And uh, so, let's see. I'm trying to think of a particular one, and it escapes me at the moment. Anyway, she was. Did she play with the House of David? Babe yes. Diedrichson? Yeah. Mm -hmm. she, uh, she gained fame in the Olympics. Right, right. Initially, that was 1932, I believe. The uh, Olympics were held. The um, Cleveland Municipal Stadium was built for the 1932 Olympics. And then they weren't held there. Here they build this huge stadium and they were played actually in Los Angeles. But she was in there. Women at that time were limited to three events. Men could be in five. Women, of course, being the weaker gender and couldn't stand up to the rigors of too many events. So she ran the hurdles and she won that. And she did the javelin, she threw the javelin she had just started doing it. She had been doing it about a month when she tried out for the Olympic team. And of course she won it. That was her second gold. The other event was the high jump. And she cleared the bar, I don't know, half a foot higher than anybody else. But she was disqualified for diving over the bar. I still don't know what that means. But uh, anyway, she was quite a celebrity there for a while. And so, People who were celebrities had to get out in the public eye to make some money. And they would just do appearances and so forth or demonstrate their particular skill. And she did that. She was with the House of David. And the way they would do it is they would, she would pitch the first inning and then they'd take her out and play the rest of the game. So she was not a regular on the team or anything. Not that it would have mattered, but she, I read at the time that of her Olympic events that, uh, that she had said she wanted to get involved in traveling. So she would join some team that traveled a lot. Well, it was perfect for the House of David and, and for her. So she traveled with them, pitched the first inning. And then sometimes as they did in Milwaukee, at the end of the game, they would play two more innings on donkeys. I had heard of donkey baseball, but I'd still never seen it. But she played that for two innings. So I was convinced that she wasn't ever in Borchard Field. She was one that I spent a long time looking for, hoping that she'd be in there so I could write about her. And I couldn't find her. And I just about given up. In fact, I had given up. And I found entirely by accident a reference to her, which led me to a couple other things. And I eventually tracked her down to Borchard. So that's what's behind the, the book. It just, uh, it's uh, research done, um, run amok. I, I don't know how to stop myself. Um, sometimes what's interesting is the person, like Didrikson or like a lot of these people. Sometimes it's the event. Sometimes it's a team that a player plays for. Uh, for example, 1944, June 15th, the Brewers are playing at Borchard Field. They had a good team. They, uh, it was about the, I think it was about 10 o'clock at night or in the late innings, maybe the seventh inning. The manager of the Brewers that year was Casey Stengel. He got the job because um, Bill Veck had gone into the army 
or actually the Marines, and was in the South Pacific. And Charlie Grimm wasn't available because he was called back by the Cubs. His first loyalty was always the Cubs. So there was an opening. Bill Beck didn't like Stengel, but he didn't hear about it until later. So they're playing this game, and it's the 15th of June. And all of a sudden, the wind picks up, and the standards, the light standards in the stadium start swaying. Well, people wondered what that was. And all of a sudden, the lights flickered off and then came on again. Then they went off again. And at that point, a straight line wind, not a tornado, came through and lifted about half of the roof off the ballpark, which had to be quite an experience. They, uh, they when they picked up all the, the debris, uh, most of it was on 7th Street or on the porches of houses along 7th Street. That was in 45. 44? It's in 44. Yeah, I was right, right the first time. And um, you would think they would, well, fix the roof, but they couldn't. They would, by law, they couldn't. The, the zoning required that you would have to bring the entire property up to modern standards. Well, this was an old park, uh, and so nothing could be made up to standards. They'd have to tear it down, and that, they didn't have the money for that. They had a lease, so there were too many hassles. So for the last roughly seven or eight years of its life, Orchard Field had half a roof. You can find pictures of it. And it doesn't look all that much different, actually. It was a dump. It was built in 1888. It was uh, the contract for it, construction, was signed in February. And one of the stipulations was that it had to be ready for opening day, which was to be May 20th. So that's not a lot of time, but they did it. They built it entirely of wood. I don't think anybody thought they could build a iron and steel ballpark that came along soon after, but um, so they had this park and I think, I believe some of the wood that was used for it was used wood. This is stuff that was salvaged and um, it would catch fire when people would toss a cigar away. So they hired kids to put out the fires with a little bucket of water. Um, so 1888, um, at that time, the White House in Washington didn't have electricity. I mean, that's how long ago this was, it's really the old days. And uh, the president, I think, was afraid of the electric light switch. So they, the president would leave the lights on overnight. And eventually one of the staff would come along and turn the lights out, but I'm afraid to touch the outlet or the switch or any part of it. Um, anyway, I'm just kind of rambling here, but this is, uh, all these things led me to something else. And so I ended up with this strange book. Um, another one that I never imagined was 1922 National Balloon Race. I had never heard of a balloon race and uh, didn't know there was such a thing, but there was, and every year they would go to a different city. And in 22, it was Milwaukee. And the only place that was suitable for preparing the balloons to fly was Borchard Field. They had a wide open space there uh, and you had a fence around it so people wouldn't get in as easily. And so they had this race and the way it worked was, it didn't matter how fast you went, it was how far. So you went up in the air and wherever you landed, that was your entry in the race. And there were 13 balloons at the start. These things were five stories high. They were huge balloons. And with the wicker basket suspended from them, uh, five stories. So there were certain rules you had. Uh, you had to carry uh, 200 feet of rope 
That was required in case you landed in a tree. So, uh, and you could carry other things just by choice. Somebody had a collapsible canoe in case they landed on water. And uh, you were required to carry all kinds of flyers, leaflets, advertising the city of Milwaukee because Milwaukee was sponsoring the thing. So they would fly up in the air and they'd toss these things all over to advertise Milwaukee. Well, it was just littering. You'd think they'd be arrested for it. But the, uh, it was quite a competitive race. One of them had a leak. The guy couldn't find the leak. He tried it overnight, all night, never did find it. But he thought, well, let's see how far I can go. So he barely cleared the top of the stadium and then headed off toward the southeast, I guess it would be. He landed in South Shore Park, what is now South Shore Park, a distance of just a few minutes, but he was part of it. Uh, the winner landed just outside of Quebec City, but close to a thousand miles. And he, he went that distance in one day. I mean, just imagine how fast that is, you know, up in a balloon and it's cold and you're freezing. And the only way you could control your direction at all was by giving it more gas. They filled them with coal gas. And you could, if you put more in, you would go up higher and you'd get into a different jet stream. And so if you, once you're up, you don't know where you're going. Nobody would aim for Quebec. Some of them went totally different directions. There was one that landed in Missouri. Uh, a couple of them were on the shores of Lake Erie. They were all over. And I, anyway, I, I thought that was a terrific event. I wish I had been around to see some of this. And that's kind of what I was thinking when I started this and when, when Rick and I talked about it. There were just interesting people there and uh, different accomplishments. In terms of, well, Ted Gullick. Ted Gullick is a guy I knew nothing about. He was a baseball player back in the 30s, late 20s or into the 30s. And he was a big favorite in Milwaukee. He had a couple tryouts in the majors, I think with the Browns. He wasn't quite good enough. Just one of those players that maxes out at a certain level like AAA or AA. So Milwaukeeans loved him. They just took him to heart for some reason. And he was a decent hitter at, in the minors, some power. And like the rest of the team, most of the team members, he didn't live in Milwaukee, except during the summer. But as soon as the season was over, he went back to uh, Kashkanon, Missouri. I think. And uh, so during the season, a lot of the ball players would rent a flat across the street um, between 7th and 8th Street. That was the extent of the, the park. The houses were very close. So you could actually get a house with overlooked the, the stadium there and it worked out very well. Well, he rented one and he became famous because he hit a home run that went through his home window. And uh, so what, after, after that happened, people would Whenever he came to bat, they yelled, hit it where you live, Ted. And everybody got a big laugh. Of course, in Milwaukee, that's amusing stuff for us. We're not sophisticated. Um, let's see. A lot of football players that were famous played in Borchard Field. The Packers played 10 times in Borchard, starting in 1921, before they were even in the NFL. And they, um, they played Racine. Racine was one of four cities that the next year were in the NFL. So the Packers survived. The, um, what is that? Am I the only one hearing that? No, no, I definitely hear it. I wonder what I, that was. 
I'm not sure who's. Sounds like a motor. Yeah. Like so. It might have been Ken's because his screen lit up. So I muted you for now, Ken. So if you need to talk, say you have to unmute yourself. Okay. Well, anyway, I was talking about the Packers, and the, there was a team that, from our scene that was co sponsored by the Horlick Malt Company and uh, a DFW Post. And uh, they survived two years in the NFL. And the Packers played them in Milwaukee, which was a neutral field. And they did that because it, it was a bigger ballpark and they could sell more tickets. Charlie Dressen, the Brewer, or the Braves manager, played football in Racine. Um, Anyway, the Packers played there, the, the, Chicago, the Chicago team played there. George Hallis was uh, the owner and uh, a player. He also was there right before he went to, or while he was with the Yankees. George Hallis played right field for the Yankees. And he wasn't, there was not for the guy right after him, but the next one was Babe Ruth. So it was quite a an illustrious place to be. Um, what else? How about Red Grange? Any questions or I mean, I could ramble on here forever. Well, one question I have is in the Racine team, did they play at Horlick Field? Or was that they around? Did. They did. They did. Yeah. And that, that, the, the, that's still standing. Still there, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's been reconfigured a little bit right. a couple of times, but yeah, it's still there. Bob? Bob? Yes. Can I share a story with you? Um, sure. My, uh, my father grew up, I think it was on 11th Street, and he kept telling me about everything that went on at Borchard Field when he was a kid. And um, he said his favorite player was, I think, Uncle Joe Hauser. Oh, Does yeah. that sound right? I'm sure. Uh, Uncle Joe? Joe. Yeah, he said that was his favorite player. But he also said that they hired him and his brother to shag foul balls. Mm -hmm. And one time he had to go up, actually go up on the roof of the grandstand, the, the roof there, and stay there till the balls were hit. So oh. I thought that was very uh, interesting. He said he hung around there all the time in the summer, he and his brother. So he had very, very good uh, memories of Orchard Field. I was born the year before it was taken down, so obviously I don't remember it at all. No, I don't either. I never saw it. I was six when they saw it. Uh, well, they did hire. Uh, they didn't actually hire them, but if you caught, if you got a baseball that went over the fence, whether it was fair or foul, if you brought it back to them, they'd let you into the park. <laughs> a lot of kids did that. Yeah. I've known several. Bob Kaler used to do that. Yeah. Bob, um, thank you. Thank you. There are a lot of people that have amazing memories of the place. Bob, I have a question about a mundane question about the park. If you do, you know anything about how, uh, if there was a regular maintenance routine to keep that field up, uh, it had to be used pretty heavily by other events, and and I think there's one reference in your book about the an event tearing it up and some concern about getting it back in shape, but what was there a regular routine? What kind of machinery or equipment did they use to, to maintain it? Do, was the grass, outfield grass any good or, or was it all dirt? Well, it depends on the time of year. Um, there's a picture in the book of um, the grounds crew preparing the field for the final opener. And um, it looks pretty decent. It start out the year with a nice lawn, um, but it would take a beating because there were so many sports that played there. And by mid season, I'm sure it was about 90% muck. And uh, in the fall, Rut. in the fall, it was just terrible because they'd have a high school game, maybe two high school games in the morning. And then 
maybe a college game in the afternoon and possibly a pro game the same day. So as far as regular maintenance, I'm sure they were constantly fixing things up, but I don't know if you'd call that maintenance, it was just patchwork. Um, the left field wall um, blew down in a storm. And uh, so they just lifted it back up and nailed it up again. And uh, so in other words, a, a really strong person could probably have pushed it right over. It was pretty bad. Um, Bob Euchre told me that he had played there, which I knew. Uh, and he, he, he said he liked the place, but he had one bad memory that kind of spoiled it for him. And that was that he was, he was talking to one of the players. He, the player was inside the park and Bob was outside. And he was maybe 10 years old or something. And uh, he was talking to the guy and he was just gonna ask for a, an autograph and the guy spit on him. And he, he was just, Euchre was so outraged, but he, nothing he could do. Um, I think the guy was Mel Queen. Uh, pretty sure. Anyway, it was, a, everything about it was informal. So people going and talking to the players and something, yeah, Fine, you know, nobody objected to that. If there were uh, something that would hinder the, the playing of a game, they'd fix it up. They'd do the best they could, and then they'd play. The way the thing was constructed, you could, if you sat in the grandstand anywhere, you couldn't see the whole field. So if you had seats behind the dugout on the third base side, you had a good view of right field but you couldn't see left field at all. So what they said was, if you want to see a ball game uh, at Orchard, the way to do it was to buy a ticket for the left side one day and the next side the other day. Um, they, uh, what else did they have? At one time, <clears throat> they had a goat. One of the players had a goat and he used to trim the, the lawn. So instead of cutting it, they just, Ralph Cutting was the name of the guy, and he had this goat, and so it took care of that part of the maintenance. They um, and the fertilizing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you get it coming and going. Uh, Bob, you know, when was the last? When did you said the Packers played there? I think you said ten times. Ten times. Uh, do you know when the last time they played there was? October first, nineteen thirty-three. Oh, uh huh. So, so I mean, there were, you, players, there were players on the field that, you know, Wisconsin fans would, would know today. They'd remember those names. The number one would be Curly Lambeau. He was coaching. Uh, he didn't play at that time. He was done, but, but he was the head coach. And uh -huh. they had decent teams back then. And they had, it was a terrible park for football. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen pictures of the way it was laid out and it, it barely fit in there. This is a fairly small park and a football field doesn't fit everywhere. Wrigley Field was like that. It barely fit. There was one corner where I saw Gary Canaffo run head first into the brick wall, almost killed himself. Well, torture was like that too. The, uh, there was a little shack, um, kind of like a chicken coop up on the roof and the, it was so rickety that the only ones allowed up there were the writers because they weren't very highly valued. But um, there were people that would go up on the roof and there were no railings or anything. People were very informal in those days. They didn't, they didn't sue anybody for anything. Everything is, uh, you take your chance. So they did. I'm looking at the group here. We've got some really good researchers on here, but you've always kind of been my my idol from a research standpoint. And I and I think I can sum it up on a statement you made early on. You're talking about ropes and you said, and I wondered. And one of the things I found from talking to you about this book and anything you're doing, you're always saying, I wonder about, and you start chasing down a rabbit hole from it. And I know 
over the last couple of years when you're working on the book, we had several conversations where you mentioned that there were three white players who played in the Negro Leagues, and you were convinced they probably played in Orchard Field, um, but you could never prove it. You could see the teams coming in by the advertising in the journal or the Sentinel, but you could never prove they played. But you spent a good deal of time. You're going to try and find it because you have an idea. I wonder, and you dig. And that's why I, I try to use that model when I'm looking for something. Got to keep digging. Well, one of those guys I talked to um, on the phone for 20 minutes, nice conversation. I can't remember his name. It starts with a C. But uh, what I wanted to know is if he had ever played in Borchard. And he said, oh, let me see. And he thought for a long time. And he, he said, no, it, it doesn't sound like I did. He, he said, I thought I'd remember because I like Milwaukee. But never found out for sure. The one I really wanted to find was Eddie Klepp. And I've sort of found him, but I, I don't have the, uh, the smoking gun. Eddie Klepp played for the Chicago, you know, like, who did he play for? Cleveland, I think, Cleveland. right? Cleveland, yeah. Yeah, uh, I and think. he played three games that you can find anything written about. And, um, and I have a hunch that the, one of them was played in Borchard Field because the Cleveland Buckeyes, which was his team, played against the Chicago American Giants in a league game. And the date was, it was the uh, Memorial Day weekend. And I found a short article, just a couple column inches. And it said that the Cleveland Buckeyes, the defending champions, will be playing a game against the Chicago American Giants on either Friday or Saturday. And this was an item in the paper about Tuesday or Wednesday. So they did this a lot in those days. They would let you know there was going to be a ball game involving a Negro League team or teams, but they wouldn't give you the box score. They wouldn't follow up on it. Now, you can find some in the Chicago Black Press, uh, but not even then they didn't cover the whole game very much. There was kind of an uneasy feeling about it. The um, Eddie Klepp, would, he was on that team. I mean, everything I've read verifies that. So the team would have been there on that weekend but it's like they vanished and uh, the Cleveland Defender and the Pittsburgh, whatever that was called, uh, never, never gave me the answer. But Eddie Klepp was uh, definitely the first white player in the Negro Leagues. And, uh, and I think Borcher probably had him, but, but I didn't use that chapter. I wrote the chapter in the book as if I knew and uh, and I didn't use it in the end. Too bad. Uh, one of the interesting things I thought was the uh, the media and that where they covered the Brewers. In 1926, they started broadcasting on the radio, so that was quite a thing. I mean, radios were pretty new; not that many people had them at that time. But shortly after that, everybody had them. But um, and for television, they televised every home game for the Brewers in 1948 and 1949. 77 games each season, and they televised each one. And which is amazing because the owner was uh, Lou Perini, who didn't allow the televising of any Braves games the whole time, he did have a few games in 62, but um, all those years, he, he wouldn't allow it. He said people wouldn't show up for the ballpark if you give it away on TV. Well, without TV, you wouldn't have a ballpark now. I mean, those things, it's changed so much. But he, he allowed them to be televised, and they weren't sure how much, what, what kind of money they should use. Uh, I mean, should they pay a certain amount per inning or based on the length of time or whatever? 
they charged him nothing. They were televised free for two years because he said, I, did, I wouldn't know what to charge him. So anyway, they, they had early TV coverage. Uh, there, were, there were certain people that I looked for, like I, I was trying to find a basketball game in Borchardt and never did. I'm sure the Globetrotters in their long history played in stranger places than Borchardt Field. They, I mean, I remember reading a book when I was in grade school and they played in all these weird places, but I couldn't find any basketball game at all in Borchardt. The best I could do was to find a Globetrotter, Goose Tatum. Goose Tatum played for, uh, I guess, the, let's see, I'm trying to think of the year. Uh, sometime in the, in the 50s, the late 50s, he was playing for the Globetrotters. And um, he, he did a lot of his clown stuff. He developed it in baseball. These things with the globe trotters, roll the ball down your arm and behind the back and hit it with your head and kick it and all these different things. He developed that stuff in the Negro Leagues playing baseball. And he was such an attraction. He would do these, he did this uh, mime kind of stuff, Sh shadow ball, they called it. And it was just mime, you know, playing baseball, but you got no ball. You play catch and you throw it in there. And apparently, I never saw it, but I, apparently it was pretty amusing because the contract with his team specified that uh, the game wouldn't be played unless he was there to do his, his routine. So some people would come to watch the pregame routine that Bruce Tatum did, and then they'd leave. They didn't care about the baseball game. Uh, but he never played that I know of in Orchard Field. If you find him somewhere, if you come across a reference to him in Borchardt Field, let me know. Bob, you mentioned 13 chapters that didn't make the book. Is there a chapter or two that you really like that you'd like to have had in the book? Well, yes and no. I mean, I would like to have all of them in the book. Right. You know, which of your children do you want to get rid of? Well, <laughs> And you did a lot of work on it to do those 13 chapters. Well, yeah, it's true. But um, I mean, I selected the ones to leave out. The, uh, the publisher never even saw them, I don't think. And in fact, nobody has seen them. It could be one of the precious few, then. What are some of the topics, Bob? That's a good question. Um, one is about the Milwaukee Brewers football team which was a semi-pro team that played in probably in the 40s, 30s and 40s. Um, I should have made a list of those. I, I, I don't know, it's hard to, one, of them, one chapter was about the 50 home run, home run hitters, the guys that hit at least 50 home runs. So uh, obviously Ruth made it mm -hmm. and uh, Hack Wilson. Anyway, that was the home run hitters. Um, there were uh, so many interesting people. You know, I might like part of a chapter and the other one not so much. Or, so uh, I don't think I have a list anywhere. I can't even answer your question. I don't know. Um, I think a lot of us would love to read the chapters? Like, would you be able to submit a chapter for the newsletter or something like that? Oh, I love you, Mary. Like, a, like, a, like each month we get a chapter that wasn't in your book? Would you be, would you want to do that? Yeah, I'd do that. That would be wonderful. You're my hero. Bonus, yeah, bonus Portrait Field. Yeah. yeah. Bonus Bob, all right. This is the sequel. Okay. Hey, Bob, are there any, are there any relics that I, from the that I never wrote? Um, people that I wanted to include, but I just, I either hadn't heard of them before the book was published or, uh, or for some reason, I just didn't find enough information. But 
I'm sure they have interested me at one time or another. <laughs> yeah, wish I had a Could it be Borchard the, Field too? Yeah. 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 Son, of, son of Borchard. The lost chapters. Uh, yeah. Um, hey, Bob, are there any relics at the Historical Society from the ballpark or any place that you know of? The uh, County Historical Society has a piece of the bench. Um, you know where Henry Aaron Field is? In Lincoln Park? It's like the 18th and... At Green Bay Avenue? Is it Green, yeah. Green Bay Avenue? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, the, uh, the light standards are the ones that were in Borchard Field. They put in lights in 1935. So it was about the time that the major leagues were starting to get lights. And I, as I told you, they, uh, Kansas City Monarchs had the telescoping portable lights, but the House of David played there probably the second night game that was played there, like 1931. It's probably just a, a year or so after the Negro League game. Uh, but they put them in Borchard in 1935. And when they put them up originally, they were in the field of play, not, in, not between the white lines, except maybe in deep left center or right center. But quite a few guys got hurt running into them. So there might be a, a light stander just down the way from the dugout. And uh, so they eventually got those out of there. But uh, another, another strange thing about Borchardt was the dugouts. They were at an angle. So 135 degree angle or something. I never knew why. I, mean, I, I guess I know sort of. It, it fits the contours of the extremity of the, of the field, which it's basically a, a U-shaped field or including the grandstand. But it was a lot of things that they did with that park were just not sensible. And others, maybe they were sensible, but they were not the best. The the stadium seated about 10,000 for most of its life. Earlier, it was far fewer. Initially, it was probably 4,000 when it was built. If you got 4,000 people in one place, that would be a world's record. There were no gatherings like that anywhere in the country. There was just nothing that caused them to need a, a huge ballpark. So you might have, maybe if you had an auto race somewhere, you'd have more people, but um, otherwise there were no crowds. So it was probably 4,000 and expanded to about 6,000 after 20 years. And in its heyday, it seated around 10,000. There's no way to know because they were, most of it was not seats, it was bench seating. Like everywhere except right behind home plate where they had folding chairs. And, uh, those were expensive, but uh, other than that, if you needed more space for fans, you brought them in and had them stand in the outfield. They did that a lot. If they, if they had 12,000 people show up, there's no way they're going to give away 2,000 admissions. People, the owners were as cheap then as they are now uh, on a much smaller scale. So uh, you could estimate it, but that's the best you could do. The biggest crowd was about 19,000. They figured that, well, they, every seat was filled, every seating place was filled. And the outfield where they would line up around the perimeter of the outfield was about 10 deep all the way around. And they figured there were about 19,000 and they turned away about 4,000 other people that they just couldn't get them in. But that big crowd was for 
a musical organization that was the favorite in, in Milwaukee, Heine's Grenadiers. You may remember Heine and the Grenadiers. They became also Joe Shot and the Hot Shots. They were on the radio initially, and then later switched over to TV. But it was like a German band with all these guys with fake German accents. And they play umpa music, and people loved it. They went crazy and, uh, and filled the ballpark. Cab Calloway, uh, he had a, a team from his band. And they would play exhibitions. And they played there, and they almost filled the place. The uh, Heine's game was uh, softball. But uh, they, Cab Calloway was a pretty good athlete himself stayed in good shape and he had played basketball. And uh, so he would, as they toured the, around the country, they would play a baseball game with some local group in the morning. And then they do, well, in, uh, in vaudeville, they probably did four shows a day. And the rest of the time they wanted to play baseball. Um, What else can I tell you? Bob, you, you said that the uh, park was leased. I, uh, I presume you mean the ball team leased the park. Do you know, do you know how much the, the lease rate was? Back in Sorry, the, I, I didn't get that. I, do you know how much the, what it cost to lease the ball field? Oh, I have no idea. I'm sure it wasn't very much. Um, I don't know. I never, I never came across that information. The reason I ask is that, that um, I, I do a lot of research into a ballpark up in, in Sheboygan that, that was for a semi-pro team. And, and I've never run across any lease rates there either, but I know that they did. I just don't know how much. Yeah, I don't know. That's a, it's an interesting question. I'm not sure where, would I, where I'd start to look for that. But it was a unique lease, Bob, because of Orch uh, because of Borchard's wife and how she sold the team, and that story with what Killalay was involved. Yeah. Well, yeah, the the ballpark was named Athletic Park when it was built, and it stayed with that name until Otto Borchard died. Borchard didn't name it for himself. He was the owner in 1927. And they used to have a pregame banquet, usually at the Elks Club downtown. And he was speaking at this welcome dinner this, uh, to kick off the, the spring schedule. And they would get about five or 600 people there. And they also, in this particular case, 1927, they were broadcast on the radio. And he was speaking in front of a sizable group and he just said, I always made it a point to do a good job for my employer, something like that. And he pitched forward onto the lectern and died live on the radio. Mm -hmm. So when he died, his attorney, which was Henry Killily, who was a former owner of the team uh, or of a different team, but uh, the Brewers in the Western League, um, his attorney, Henry Killily, bought the team from Otto Borchardt's widow. And he did it as a favor to her because she didn't know how to run a team and didn't have any interest. So he sold it eventually. And um, he drew up a lease which gave the ownership of the ballpark to Ida Bell Borchardt, the widow. And there was a stipulation in there that it, it was a 25 year lease. So it would expire after the 1952 season. And it said that if there, any home game of the Brewers were played anywhere other than Orchard Field, then the ownership of the club would revert to her. So in other words, it was an ironclad contract and the team might have built a new park 
or the city might have built one, which would have been really different, but they couldn't because of that lease. So that's why they had this dump of a ballpark. Half of the roof is gone, splintered seats, uncomfortable, no parking. There were no cars, of course, when it was built, so no need for parking. Well, in the picture uh, in the fifth chapter 15, uh, the, about the uh, Packers, um, and I, I'm not big on reading football, so it was not my favorite chapter yet. It's one of my favorites because there's the picture of the Packers playing, and the houses look like they're part of the damn stadium. They were so oh, they're really close. Yeah, it's just amazing when you look at those houses there. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, those houses are still there in most cases. They still <laughs> line those two streets. It looks bigger now that the expressway goes there than it would have if it were just part of a neighborhood. But it was only one block wide. And, uh, and of course, that gave them all kinds of limitations on the fence and how far things can be. And when, uh, when Lou Perini bought the team in 1945, uh, he wanted to upgrade the ballpark, there wasn't a whole lot they could do, but to make it easier for people to see the both fields left and right, he moved home plate about 25 feet to the north, which opened up the, the view of the foul lines. So they were finally able to see them. He did what he could, but again, it was pretty limited. Uh, now, Sheboygan, you mentioned Sheboygan, Wally? Right, yep. Um, is that the Lakeshore League that played there? That's correct. It was the Lakeshore League uh, semi-professional ball. It, from 1905, which the, was an informal year in 06, was informal through the, the into the early 1920s. And then it, it kind of shifted. They, it, they joined other leagues in between there. But yeah, it's it's, a, it's the Lake Shore League. Were they the chairmakers or something? Yep, that's right. The Sheboygan chairmakers. Yeah. Well, I don't know a lot about it, but I know a little. Well, uh, like I, I emailed you, and I, I'll, I've got more questions that are more particular that I'll save for later because I don't think any everybody'd be interested in that. Well, they're not interested in any of this. <laughs> we do what we can, right? <laughs> yep. But yes, that's right. It, the Sheboygan Chairmakers and their ballpark, by the way, when you're talking about the houses being right, right up against the, the, uh, the field. Well, right across the street, this, this, this ballpark occupied one city block for 17 or 18 years. And it was made of, of wooden, the grandstand was wood, just, just like um, Athletic Park in Milwaukee. In fact, I'm pretty sure that they modeled a lot of what they did uh, in Sheboygan after what was done at Athletic Park. And that old wooden grandstand fell apart just like Athletic Park did. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there were a lot of similarities. Well, the building materials for one. Like the polo ground where it was like, you know, not in the corner, the home plate wasn't in the corner. It was like in the middle of the block. No, in Sheboygan. Was it like that? No, it was in the corner. It was in the okay. southeast corner of the block. They what they did there was they took a grandstand from uh, a race course, a racetrack called Driving Park, and in a hurry they needed a place to play because they lost the field in 1904. At the end of 04, they they scrambled to get something uh, in 06. That was so. Anyway, they they moved the grandstand, and it was a wooden grandstand built. Guess what? Into the late 1880s. So. <laughs> Anyway, it's the similarities are pretty pretty are unusual, but except home plate was in the corner of the block. But I'm I'm still working on the, getting the dimensions right. I'm going to be asking Bob about dimensions later. Okay. I think the old grandstand in West Bend goes back to the 30s. I actually think it, when they that that's been moved a couple of times. So. I think I'm. I think I'm the only one here who needs a timeline. 
if the lease on Orchard was 52, it was going to go away, and the Braves come in in 53 to County Stadium, when was County Stadium built and why was it built? County Stadium was, was built for the Brewers, minor league team. And uh, Milwaukee Braves were in Boston. There was no Milwaukee team. So they built the ballpark hoping they would attract a major league team, but not really expecting to very soon. And in fact, the general manager of the Brewers guaranteed the fans that they'd be playing in County Stadium by, I think he said the 1st of July. And, and that's what they believed. They thought that would be the minor league park. But then the Braves showed up and the uh, Brewers became the Toledo Glass Sox, which was an incredible name. Uh, so anyway, the, it was, I don't think it was coincidence, but uh, the, the lease expired after the 52 season. And by the time it would have opened for the next season, the Braves were in it. It was only, it only seated 28,000 County Stadium did when it was built. Uh, 28,000 they thought was really more than they needed for a minor league team. But as I said, they were hopeful of someday attracting a major league team. So they wanted a little extra space, but they didn't have the grandstands down very far down the, the foul lines. Uh, the grandstand was pretty small. And then in fact, between March 18th, when they were officially the Milwaukee Braves and opening day, which is April 15th or 14th, they added quite a few seats. Uh, they added temporary bleachers. And, uh, and so they got it up to 34,000, but that was a minor league park initially. Well, I think, I think, it's, I think you wonder what, Sorry, go ahead. I think it's a great coincidence that Eddie Matthews, the man who eventually winds up, the only guy who winds up playing for Boston, Milwaukee, and Atlanta, was already in Atlanta and Milwaukee before he was in Atlanta and Milwaukee. Yeah, no, it's amazing. Well, there's some higher power. Thanks, uh, somebody's controlling that. Jackie Price, anybody know about Jackie Price? Is he the guy who did Upside Down, caught yep. Upside Down? He did so many amazing things. You wouldn't think a human could do them. He was a ball player who wasn't very good. And everybody told him, you should find another line of work. One of the people was Bill Veck. He said, you're never gonna make it. You're a nice guy, but you don't have it. So he stayed away from baseball for, I don't know, seven years whatever the duration was. And he just practiced all these tricks and he became just an amazing person. He could hang upside down and bat. And to him and he invented this, this bar portable thing he'd set up and he'd hang upside down. Um, but he did so many other things that he could hold three baseballs in one hand well, that's not so unusual, but with one pitching motion, he could throw one, one of those three balls to the third baseman, one to the pitcher, and one to first base. One motion. He, um, he had a Jeep, and he would drive around in the Jeep and catch fly balls. He also had a, a slingshot, a big slingshot, and he could shoot that thing up high enough that he could hop into his Jeep, and drive out, and catch it. Now you tell someone this, they're not gonna believe you unless you've seen it. And I have, I never saw him in person, but he is on YouTube there. and uh, you can get, I don't know which ones, he does all those tricks, but he uh, was just amazing. He played for the Brewers, maybe for a month, played briefly, I think in the big leagues with Cleveland, but uh, he was, mainly an entertainer, just did incredible things. Oh, he could, he'd go out in the outfield and he'd catch fly balls in his shirt, in his pants. I mean, <laughs> this is a guy that lived life on the edge. 
Uh, so there were all kinds of interesting people. There, I, I always thought it, how interesting it would have been if I had lived right across the street from Borchard and all the incredible people and events I could have seen. Be fantastic. Bob, do you have a particular favorite in the book? You probably mentioned already because you mentioned so many things. Yeah, you know, if, if you, someone asked you to, you know, pick that child, would you, what, what would you say it is? Well, I don't know. Jackie Price would be one of them, but um, I don't know. The event I would like to have seen would be that football game yeah. with the Oorang Indians and Paul Robeson. There were two touchdowns scored in the game. Robeson scored both of them. But all the stuff about the Oorang Indians, I mean, I just find that stuff fascinating. And the guy did that just because he wanted to sell Airedales. He had this special breed of Airedale. And the yeah, I love just the minor stories, like how you tied in Stormy Cromer. Like those hat, those hats are popular again, and. Yeah. I'm sorry, what was that? They came back. Yeah, they came back. Yeah. And he has a connection to Portrait Field. So. Yeah. He has a connection to Sheboygan too. And really? He yeah. played there for a season, uh, 1905 or 06, one of the 05, I think. But Stormy Cromer died in Heartland, Wisconsin, did you, or just okay. outside of Heartland. Hmm. Uh, He's quite a guy. You know that he, Cromer, Cromer um, helped organize a bunch of kids in the 1940s in Heartland. Um, they, he, he, came, he, uh, he came across the, the park where these kids were playing and they didn't have enough for two teams. So he, uh, he noticed that they wanted to play and he, he had practices during the week. And on Saturdays, he would take the kids into Milwaukee to play boys clubs teams. And then he'd bring them back to, to his place in, on Lake Pewaukee and to take them swimming and whatnot. But this was after he was done managing and playing in the 40s. Uh, Bob, if I can take a break here real quick, I just want to talk about a couple upcoming meetings that we have before everybody starts jumping off here. Saturday, we have our joint chapter meeting with Chicago. Um, we have uh, Scott Bush, who's Sabres CEO, is going to be on talking about the minor league reorganization. And then we're going to have a Negro Leagues panel that Chicago group has put together with uh, Sean, Gib uh, Sean Gibson, uh, uh, with Simpkis, Scott Simpkis, uh, Mark Armore, and Larry Lester. And, mm -hmm. uh, and with uh, uh, Sean Gibson, there's an effort out there to change the name of the MVP award too the Josh Gibson MVP award. So it sounds like it's gonna be a very, very interesting meeting. So that's Saturday morning at uh, 1230 um, uh, central time. Uh, and then- oh, 1230, I thought it was 1130, but does anybody have the time? Um, it's 1230, okay. I'll go by 1230 if you- Yeah, um, yeah I think so, cause I think I've got it at 1130 here. Uh, I, I have uh, 11. I have 1230 Eastern time on my calendar. Yeah. I was pretty sure it was 1130 Central time. Okay, I will. Yeah. Okay. I want to double uh, check. Get off, I'll jump off of here then real quick. I'll take, take pull up the invite. Um, on um, uh, In December, we had Jane Levy on talking about Big Fella and that she talked about um, uh, uh, Sandy Koufax and then her novel, um, Squeeze Play. Uh, and a number of people from the Har uh, Halsey Hall chapter were on and they bought the book. I bought the book. I know Mary, you did too. And so they're going to have Jane on uh, April 3rd uh, at 9.30 in the morning central time to discuss squeeze play. And if you've read the book, you really want to know how, who some of these people are, these characters are based on. So, uh, so she's having that. And then Mary, what's our next book club? Oh, um, the next book club selection is uh, K, and um, are, we're looking at April 7th. That would be a Wednesday night. Do, do people like Wednesday nights? Um, I mean, we'll keep doing this as long as 
want to keep doing it. So, um, but the next book is, we'll do it April. Um, do you like Wednesday nights? Here's the book, hey. It's um, a history of baseball in 10 pitches. I, I'm about two thirds the way through. It's, it's fascinating. I mean, just, it goes by uh, through 10 of the most basic pitches and all these stories and tidbits about each pitch. And it's much different than, you know, it's not the same old rehash of things you would know. So um, I really hi highly recommend it. I'm not sure if we can get the author for this. He writes for the New York Times. He's an excellent writer, Tyler Kepner. If anybody has a close personal relationship with Tyler Kepner, let me know. <laughs> Otherwise I can reach out to him and see if he'll join us. You never know. We can try. So, um, but I highly recommend it. It's excellent. Mary, is that April 3rd? I think April 7th April is the Wednesday. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, that's on Wednesday. Have you, have, you, uh, have you reserved that yet, Mary? I haven't reserved it. I was going to check yeah. with you guys. So if that's good with you, I will do 7 mm -hmm. o'clock on Wednesday night. Okay. Yeah. Unless you prefer like Saturdays once in a while. Um, otherwise, we'll just stick maybe with one more Wednesday. And then we'll see how it goes with the baseball season and with, um, I don't know how many of you have gotten vaccinated. I haven't, but. Um, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Yay, yay. Thanks, uh, good, good. Um, I've had them so both. We have in-person meetings. Both? What, how, how'd you do? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Francis, she had them both. How was, yeah. how was, how, how was the, uh, how was the after effects? Uh, the first one I hardly failed. You know, really, it was like somebody punched me in the arm a little bit, the shoulder. And then the second one, was, I had, well, I, I know that most people have had much more effects, and they tell me that most people have a lot greater effect for the second one than the first mm -hmm. one. But uh, I did not have that much. I, I felt like I had a sniffles the next day, but that's about it. But I, I the nurses and doctors here, tell you that the second one is more likely to have an effect than the first. But, but it is, it's not bad. Not bad at all. I had the Pfizer, by the way. Me too. Or just the first. Mm -hmm. Okay, commercial over, Bob. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Other questions for Bob? Pushing the hour and a half mark, if Bob, are you still okay for some questions? No. Yeah, or do you have any stories you, you'd like to share, either of you, any of you? Well, one thing that uh, I put in the book, um, Babe Ruth was a pitcher, of course, when he started out, but he pitched his last game, I think in 1933, if I remember correctly. He pitched one game that year. He hadn't pitched in a couple of years. And then the last day of the season, he pitched. I think it's 33. Well, Ted Williams also pitched one time. And um, pitched two innings, never pitched again. And the interesting part of it, if you didn't know, know it already, is that they had the same catcher. I mean, what, what are the odds of that? There's a guy who pitched only once, another guy who hadn't pitched in years, and they're separated by quite a few years. I think about nine years. And they both have the same catcher. Anyway, that's my story. A friend of mine who would, a friend of mine who'd be probably early hundreds now, when he was a kid growing up in Milwaukee, went to one of the exhibition games that Babe Ruth was at. And he said the kids came, he, he and the other kids came out and crowded around Ruth and he threw a ball up in the air and all the kids looked up and Babe Ruth was gone. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he got rid of the kids. Um, so Bob, what, what are you researching now? Um, trying to write an obituary for Hank Aaron. Oof. Just for the for our TP, the newsletter of the Milwaukee Braves Historical Association. 
it's hard to write something that hasn't been written a hundred times. Uh, I mean, what is there? To... Anyway, that's what I'm working on. We that's went through that with Jane Lovey. We were like giving her all these suggestions and she's yeah. like, that's been done. That's, you yeah. know. Yeah. She did a great job. I didn't hear it. I had computer problems that night, but I heard it online. Mm -hmm. She was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. She, have you, were you doing something on Warren Spahn? No. Okay, I thought you might have. And then you did a book on Pulaski High School. I don't know I if yep. anybody else has a connection to Pulaski. Rick. Yeah, Rick, uh, yeah I know Rick, yeah, yeah. No, nah, I was mighty, mighty Washington, you know, so sorry folks, so yeah. <laughs> but has anybody um, been to the site of Borchard Field? Like just, it's kind of weird because the freeway goes way down low. Um, how many of you have been there? It's it's kind of interesting to see because a lot of the houses are like you talked about the houses and they're right there, mm -hmm. and um, all those houses the on houses that talk, those yeah. houses. I mean, they, the players that they saw, yeah. Babe Ruth hit a very long home run in an exhibition and across the street and over the house and landed in the backyard. And they claimed that was the longest home run hit in Borchard. Um, I Josh can imagine. Gibson, though, Josh Gibson hit a home run there. Is you there know, a plaque or anything up? Like there it, at the site? I think exactly. it's, it's at third, right? It's isn't on Fifth Street or it's it's like oh, it's away from the ballpark, right? Yeah, it's yeah, right. It's at City Park. There's a, a diamond it's in that park. Yeah, I think the plaque went up about twelve years ago through the Milwaukee County Historic Society and some other sponsors. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right behind, a, 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 right by a Senior Citizen Center between uh -huh. the Clinton Center Rose and Rose. a ballpark. Is it Clinton Rose? Yeah, is that the park? Yes, yeah. that's yeah. the one. Yeah. yeah. But when I work at Miller Park, there are a lot of old, once in a while I get an old timer who talks about Borchard Field, that they live right there. One guy said he had like a crate of baseballs because they would just land on his porch. I mean, if you could imagine yeah, um, living right near there. And I, and I think a lot of these old timers, they don't realize all the stories, Bob. You know, I tell them to read your book because they probably don't realize the history they lived right across the street right, from. It's just right tremendous. Yeah, it had to be amazing. Yeah. Well, I was glad when Mary said we should read the book because I thought that'll be a fun book to read a second time. And your books are always good reads, fun to read, and always interesting, Bob. So, uh, you know, this is just thank you for giving me a reason to read your book. Now I got to read the other two again. You'd be my PR man. Yeah. <laughs> the, the usual cut? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good. <laughs> the same as the lease for the field. Uh, no, I think the lease in the field was known. Mine is unknown. I think it's a zero. No, mine is known. And I wouldn't take anything from Bob. Hell, I'd <laughs> be glad to talk up your books, Bob. <laughs> I have a 10-second show and tell. Someone, first two minutes of the program, mentioned Bob Costas' story about his baseball card. This is the baseball card. Oh, oh wow. The 1958 Mantle All-Star card. I never knew what it was until he mentioned it, you know, two, a week ago. Yeah. And I'm sure he didn't know he was going to mention it, but he finally told us what it was. Wow. And this is it. And you had it all along, Dixie? That's yeah. Awesome. I, was, I, have the, I have the 58 set. This is just part of it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I have a brother who's 13 years older than me, and he Thanks, kept Tim. all the, all these baseball cards. My mother kept them in the basement. She in a big old dresser, and there must be a thousands. And my 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 brother has like all you know the whole series of these like those television cards, and he has all these rookie cards. It's but most people threw them away or put them on their bike, so it would make a really cool sound. You yeah. never put stuff on your bike unless you have it four <laughs> times. That's the rule. <laughs> unless you're was, an idiot. <laughs> speaking of uh, baseball cards, I have, these are Milwaukee Brewers oh. T206s. Wow. Those are amazing. Those are expensive. Where'd you get those? 
<laughs> those are so cool. I think I just bought them off of eBay, like yeah. probably like 15 years ago. They're Randall and McLynn. So these would have been 1909. They would have played at Orchard Field. They look like the Hannes Wagner series, yeah. but I don't know it's if the that's- same. Yeah. Yeah, it's the T206 or whatever that. Yeah. yeah, McGlynn. Is that what it says? Yeah, it's McGlynn is the one on the right. McGlynn pitched for the yeah. Manitowoc team in the Lakeshore League. That's very cool. Wow. That's great info. Yeah, I was wondering if they're, I was looking for them in the book. I think, I think McGlynn was mentioned. He was. Not sure. Yeah. Very cool. I have a I have a quick Hank Aaron story. The only one I have. I was on vacation, 1974. I was in San Diego. Braves were playing there. Had to go see the game just to see a game in San Diego. And Henry Aaron was going to be there. Well, it turned out to be the game in which Henry Aaron hit two home runs for the last time in his career. Oh, wow. And I saw the first one. And then it late, later in the game, it was time for me to call my friend Jim back here in Boston because I call him from the ridiculous places that I go to. And while I was on the phone, the second one was hit toward me in center field. So I was able to announce it as it flew into the stands. But that was August of 74. Wow. That's amazing. Oh, very nice. I, have a, talk about, I, have a of, oh, I was going to say, I have a couple of artifacts to share if you wanted to see. The first one was uh, Bob had talked about the, uh, the Oorang Indians. No. So we can see. Well, I better turn my light off here. <laughs> turn the light down. I like this idea of show and tell. I was thinking we should do this. It, it, it just. Yeah, good idea. Everybody has something. Yeah. Let's try again here. No, I'm getting, still getting too much of a. Well, if I can get a, get the reflection off. Of Just back it up a little bit. Well, what it is, it's it's a it's an actual ticket from that game. <laughs> from, the, from the 1922 Oorang Indians uh, uh, Milwaukee Badgers game. Wow. November 22nd, 1922. Actually, Sunday, November nineteenth at Athletic Park. I believe. Yeah, I misspoke. Yeah, that's it. Uh, what it looks like, um, it was a. Uh, it's stamped by one of the Urang players. From what I understand, they handed these out at the taverns around the area, but the guy could get credit for bringing the. Uh, uh, the the attendant or or the somebody attends, I can't remember, see if I can make this one out. Baptiste, Baptiste was I think was one of the players on the Oorang Indians, but it's got his stamp on the on the ticket. It's more like a postcard. And geez, I can't I can't get a, a glare off of it. The other one I was going to show. Where did you get that? I I bought it at a, at a at an online auction a while back. There was a find of these things. There's probably about 20 of them out there in existence now. Oh. The other is, a, this one you might be able to see a little bit better. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a program from Babe Ruth at Borchard Field. Wow. Is that 1928? This no, is the 31 a, game. 31, yeah. 28 he was with Gary. Yeah, this one wasn't. That was just him and a, and a few of the other major leaguers. I have grabbed my other one. That's amazing. <laughs> that he has that. I can show off my Bob Beagie books. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I have the whole collection. Wow. <laughs> this one is the last Packers game at Fortress Field. Wow. 1933. Yep. October Sunday, 1st. October 1st. Yeah. Packers Giants. That's amazing, John. Excellent. Yeah, Mary, that's a good idea. Bring artifacts or memorabilia or 
curiosities? Is that a possible show, show and tell for a meeting? I was thinking more, of doing my, that and it just kind of came about organically. This is wonderful. Yeah. yeah. My, my wife, Sam, my wife, Sam grew up across from Borchard Field. She lived on 7th Street, just south of Burley. And I think she gave this to us like 30 years ago, but it's like one of the slats that Bob was referencing before. And I have no reason to doubt that it came from Borchard Field, but it still is a little paint on. And I guess it's four feet long. Um, we also got the side pieces for the bench. I, I didn't realize Borchard Field was, uh, you know, had a lot of bench seats. So I had the color matched on this, had new slats made, and we recycled the, the metal side pieces. And we still have the bench after all these years. But I kept the original pieces. You know, you don't want anything. Nice. You certainly don't want to sit on it and break it. <laughs> I'm going I'm to trust her that it came from Borchard Field. I have no reason to doubt her on that one. I recall stories of the balls hitting the house and, you know, on the porch and all that stuff when she was a little kid. And, you know, then then the myths of balls falling into bassinets of the kids and things like that. I'm not so sure about that, but it makes for a good story. Yeah, great story. It's fantastic. Yeah, thanks for sharing all this stuff. It's, yeah. I wish I could see it all in person. So hopefully maybe one day we can share in person. John, why did you start collecting the old Borchard Field stuff? I put myself back on the view. Uh, I, I'm just a, was interested in the old brewers and, and whatnot. It wasn't so much that it was just Borcher Field per se. But uh, I've got I've got quite a few artifacts and I've been collecting for a long time. Uh, Bob Kaler kind of got me interested in it as well too back in, back in the day. Good one again. Teach you the habits there, or give, give you the. I should habits. mention the Jim Nitz. Jim was nice enough to give me a picture of the TV cameras on the roof of Orchard Field. It's in the book. Thank you, Jim. Jim is a super nice guy. He's, yeah. yeah. Bob, I have a quick question. Did any of the the um, you know there are a lot of barnstorming teams that probably went through Orchard Field. Do you know of any of the women's teams that played? The Bloomer Girls? Not that I know of. Good question. Um, there. <laughs> bobblehead. Made right here in Milwaukee. Yeah, Milwaukee Chicks Bobblehead. I mean, that was the Girls League. But yeah, I don't know about barnstorming teams. That's a good point. I can't remember. I remember seeing a reference to that. I don't know. They have old postcards of you know, women's teams who played and who won. Usually, you know, they played on a team and usually the battery was uh, male and then they'd switch batteries with the male team that they played. And I would imagine they played in somewhere in um, at Fortune Field, but it's probably hard to find info. So, hmm. Just curious. So. Well, there's something else to look up. There you That's go. what you need. There's, we'll keep you busy, Bob. There's the 14th chapter. Yeah. <laughs> and the, you and the, trouble. The, and a challenge for Wally. Hey Wally, can you see if they played up in Sheboygan? <laughs> so. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I'll take a look. Yeah. Here's I'll another one. Look. Yeah. Bloomer Girls. Yeah. Maud Brewers Nelson was did. one of the big ones. So Brewers did play postseason games up up there up in Sheboygan, but I haven't found any girl, girls teams or women's teams yet. We're past the hour and a half, so I'm going to turn the recording off uh, so it doesn't get too long, but we can keep chatting, you know, so nobody's following us. Maybe. There we go. Mary, you want me to 